over at the uh, gorgeous Bluebell Lakes. I'm here with Mr. Frank Warwick, who's uh, kindly agreed to have a little chat with us on camera while he's uh, having a little fish. And hopefully he's going to catch a few as well. <laughs> yeah, some big ones. <laughs> yeah. I've had, I've had two in the last 20 hours. Yeah. Both 23 pounders. So. And how do you, you have them? Did you have them on the zigs? Or? No. Uh, yeah. It was cloudy and overcast and raining when I got it. So yeah. the fish were uh, showing, displaying, which was good. Yeah. So you didn't need any guess. I fished this swim quite a bit as well. So I know how deep it is. And I know when they're on the bottom. Yeah. So it was, you know, a no-brainer really. Fair play. Fair play. Yeah. Um, yeah so. Obviously, you're, you're a well-known angler. There's no doubt about that. You've, a long uh, time angler. Yeah, you've been fishing yeah. a long, long yeah. time. You've got many, many achievements under your belt, haven't you? Yeah, it's so, hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, time um, goes quick. Fifty-four this year. Oh yeah. 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 Goes so yeah. fast, don't it? <laughs> Too fast. The older you get, the faster it goes. Yeah. So how, how did you how did you get into fishing? What was what was your sort of inspiration? Uh, did it just sort of happen? Uh, well, when I was a kid. My dad was in the Royal Navy and he was never around when I was younger. Um, he used to make up for it when he came on leave from the Navy. He'd be like, let's go bird's egg collecting or let's go watching Speedway at Bellevue or this or that. And we were doing all sorts. I mean, bird's egg collecting, there's, you know, you, you get shot for saying that. These days, but <laughs> most of the kids used to do it Back when then, I was yeah, younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, but we tried all sorts and then uh, I wanted to go fishing. I suggested it, and uh, my dad didn't have a clue about it. Right, it was useless. And uh, so we bought all this stuff from Woolies, and I went with him. And uh, I, I had a knack for it. Straight away, I was catching fish and stuff, and he was useless. And he had me putting the rods in for him and everything. <laughs> we used to go to a place called Roman Lakes, and I was catching ropes there one day, and uh, I uh, hooked a carp on there, and. Uh, that dates back to the 40s, that place, you know. And uh, I thought, oh, I wouldn't mind fishing for these. And then I went to Cape Stone Hall. Yeah. And uh, I thought, I'm going to go for the carp. So back to Woolies. But, uh, it was a choice between the five quid rods or the six quid ones. <laughs> I couldn't quite stretch to six quid a piece. So <laughs> so it's five, a five one. quid rod. Yeah. And uh, I had loads of fish on them, you know. It, it just grew from there, really. And that was. Uh, 1966. Fair play, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, well, I started fishing in 1966, and then when I started properly carp fishing, doing nights and things, was uh, 1970. Really? Yeah. Do you realise that was before I was even born? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Can yeah. we have a knock? I told you, I had a feeling that one would go, so I can't believe it didn't do it for the camera. <laughs> it's normally right. <laughs> it's normally right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you've um, you've you were born up in Manchester, weren't you? Is that no? I was born in Malta. Oh, you was born? Oh right, okay. Yeah, my dad was stationed there in the Royal Navy. Right, I'm right, not, right. I'm not a Maltese. Right. <laughs> my mum was in the Wrens, which is like right, the women's yeah, version. Yeah, I oh, know. Yeah, yeah. So they got stationed there, and I was born there. You know. Yeah. And then uh, lived in uh, Edinburgh for a while, Scotland. And, uh, I've all over the place. Really. Say, but you've been all over the place. Yeah, but most of my life is spent around Manchester, you know, yeah. Cheshire. Yeah, yeah. Some good waters around there. You had yeah. some, uh, you used to fish uh, Reedsmere, didn't you? Like the, yeah, that's, that was the. I've heard various stories. Of yeah, your that's the place where I caught the first better fish, really, you know. It was the place, I used to fish Cape Thorn for years, and then I thought it's time to move over the road. It was almost like a stepping stone. That was the big league in them days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, started fishing there about for carp about 1978. And uh, remember the first one I got was in winter. Yeah. Winter fishing. Never done a fish in the winter. So, so, so from, yeah, from your very first, it was, a, it was yeah, like, yeah. up against it. Really. Yeah, yeah. I had three runs that night as well. Fantastic. Yeah, on yeah. bolt rigs. Yeah, yeah. With my uh, old made fish meals. Yeah. Which was unusual in them days. Yeah. Everyone used to use 50 50. Have you always been sort of that way inclined? Bait or making your, yeah, 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 your bait? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. to sort of do it yourself? Oh, yeah, even in the old pace days, I used to mess around. And yeah. The amount of twitches you got on the old, uh, you know, the squeezy bottle tops off yeah. the washing up liquid. I know, see, this is this is how I started with the yeah. like, 
balancing coins on top of the rails. That's right, with yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the we don't have any bosses. Backy tin below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, I remember yeah. all that. Well, what we did was we uh, used to free line a lot, you know, with a size two hook in it, and you put a ball of paste on like a golf ball, and they'd whittle it away. Yeah. But the, the amount of action you got used to reflect what, how good the ingredients were inside the bait. Yeah. What I noticed, ironically, <coughs> even in the early 70s, was I was messing around with curry powder and chilli powder. And when I put the chilli powder in, the fish went mad on it. Right. So obviously, I knew then that the fish are attracted to chilli. To the chillies, yeah. And yeah. Uh, all curry spices the fish are pretty keen on. Yeah. And, you know, turmeric as well is another one. Garam masala. So I still use those to the giving away all your the trade bit. secrets. No, so. not really. It's, you know, a lot of people probably try that. But uh, yeah, well, chilies, chilies a massive favourite, isn't it? You know, chili flakes and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, but do you know why it is? A lot of people think it's because they actually, they probably do like the taste of it. But it's some of the uh, ingredients or the the natural elements of chilies irritate the taste buds right okay they flare them up and it's almost like uh, do you know when you you have something that's full of red hot curry powder and chilies in it yeah your nose starts running yeah and uh, your eyes can almost water that's irritated your taste buds that's what's that's what's happening well right. carp have got more than 10 times more than we've got so it irritates all the taste buds and they can't feel as much with the mouth right so they're more likely to make a mistake with the rig. With the rig because they've lost a lot of the sensation. Yeah, I wrote about right, that yeah. because basically, if you went to, how shall I put it? Say you found a hair in your food, you, you, you can tell instantly there's a hair in your mouthful of food. Yeah. They can with a, with a hook and all the rest of it, it's like in and out in, yeah. a, in a nanosecond, unless it takes a hold. But you start inflaming and flaring up their taste buds with it in your hemp, yeah. you can't feel the same. It's like a Bongella and a yeah, natural got, antiseptic. Yeah. Not, well, not an antiseptic, like a natural... Uh, it's a numbing kind yeah. of... Yeah, yeah. A numbing uh, sensation. Yeah. Anesthetic. Yeah. Uh, the same as a robot uh, clove oil. That does the same thing. That yeah, completely in, it's like Bongella with kids. Yeah. It numbs all the nerves. It, what it does is it's... Uh, salt is one of the... Uh, Ways the salinity in any kind of water it stops the message going through to the nerves and it, it, it does something inhibiting with that. Right. So, uh, so when people are adding the chili and the salt into their bites, it's actually, yeah. it, 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 essentially, it's, it's numbing the mouths of the carp yeah, stuff as yeah, they're yeah. feeding yeah. and upping your chance of getting a, a decent yeah, yeah, hook yeah. yeah, So that's the whole point of it, not that the carp are actually enjoying well, uh, eating that. Yeah, with, with salt, I think there's. There's a multi-layered reason for that. Uh, every living creature has to have salt in its yeah, diet. Yeah. That's why you get salt licks for the cattle. Yeah. If they don't have that in the field and they're not getting salt, the health suffers immediately. Right. Shows yeah. really quick. Same yeah. with horses. Uh, and I was, you know, uh, when they had this uh, epidemic of rabbits in Australia. Yeah. Well, they found that they're eating all the uh, the bark on fencing. You know, you get a, just a tree type of staple that's yeah. been put in with the fencing on it. Or well, not a staple, a post. A post, yeah. And they leave the bark on it. The rabbits were eating the... Actually uh, stripping the bark off. Because it had creosalt on it. Right. The creosalt, the salt is part of the preservative. And the rabbits were eating it, they noticed, to get at the salt. Right. And in the springtime, when carp are wanting to spawn in particular, and they're going to use a lot of their energy and their, their uh, the vitamins and everything that they need, they particularly need a lot of salt. Right. So that's the best time to be using salt, really, yeah. Yeah. in your bait. And, uh, or maybe not so much in the bait, but, you know, I use it in the particles, I always have. And uh, I do use it in the bait, but in not in stupid quantities. And stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, some people are getting a bit giddy with that. And, uh, I know, it's... My it's, first thoughts is for the health of the fish, you know. Definitely, and, and, yeah. Uh, so I use it very modestly. And, uh, you know, it does worry me when you see these articles where some, to some people they know no limits and think, oh, salt, I can't put enough salt in, get more in, more in, more in. And uh, 
It is a bit worrying, yeah. This well, we don't know the physiology of carp exactly, how it might react with them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There's no sort of control no, I mean, there around it. No, it, it probably wouldn't do so much because it's in such a volume of water. Yeah. Yeah. But just because we don't think it might not isn't a good reason we for just doing it. We don't know the long-term effects. No, it so be. I'd rather be a bit modest with it. Yeah, you know? definitely. Like you say, add, yeah. add a bit into your, your particles and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Use it very liberally in your baits, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I use it, I use it in uh, food bait, you know. Yeah. So, talk to me about the spod. Because... Um, I've had it on quite good authority that you were sort of quite instrumental in the in the starting of the use of the spod and yeah. Well, sort of what it was was uh, I I was fishing the the mare in the early days and uh, I started fishing with a lad called Steve Cook and he was with this Macclesfield specimen group and they're all like mad on fishing on reeds mare and we were mass baiting with maple peas and stuff and. Uh, between us, we'd made like a rudimentary spot from these cotton bobbins, because Cookie worked in a cotton mill, so he was just getting, you know the old guard ones that had the hook on the top? I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. Well, they were just like a, like a tapered, almost like a plastic beaker. Right. So we're using them and they flew like a bag of spanners. <laughs> they were terrible, they were tumbling through the air. We used to put yeah. sand on the top to keep the maple peas in or yeah. whatever we were using. Yeah. And they'd be going with a massive big crash and they were, they were like a house brick going on. <laughs> well, we, we still caught fish on them. Yeah. I thought this needs refining, so I started messing around with steridant tubes with the, the flights. And I also rationalised that my marker was flying terrible. And uh, so I got a hacksaw and cut into a balsa float, and I got dart flights and put it in it. And uh, I was messing around with big plastic ones as well. And the reason being, I remember this uh, pike angler from the early 70s, and I met him once, and his name was Chris Binion. He's dead now. But I, he was messing around with drift, drift fishing for pike, even in them days. Right, yeah, way back then, yeah. And he yeah. had, on his pike floats, he'd messed around. <coughs> so it wasn't entirely my idea, but I thought, I remembered it in the back of my mind from about 1972, and I thought, do you know what? That'll work that'll for the work carpet, on them. and I'll be able to see my marker in all different light conditions. Yeah, yeah. I tried it and it went out a dream, and I thought, everyone's like that on the mirror. Bloody hell, look at that, you can see he's float miles away. So, yeah. we all started doing it. But I refined the spot down, and uh, I was getting miles. It, it was just brilliant, you know. Yeah. And Because uh, we usually mainly boilies then, at that stage. And, uh, it was kind of one of those revolutionary points, weren't it? I think the spot. Yeah, well, I, I yeah, I had uh, I used to have a friend, uh, Paul Nichols, and he owned uh, an advertising company, and he's seen the, the very early spots that I'd made with the flights on and markers. And he went, "Why don't I put some money into this, and you could start your own company doing these?" And I just couldn't see him in mind that it would be big enough. And then I wrote about it and put it in a magazine, and then. About a year later, old Nash brought out floats with the, the little veins, the on, veins on and everything, yeah. yeah. And probably sold tons of them, you know. And I thought, why didn't you do you that? You missed the know? trick there. Yeah, yeah, it's the story of my life. That, it's a, is it a similar thing for the boiler stick? Because. Um, oh, I didn't invent the throwing stick, basically. No, I mean, that was that South American game where they fire the balls with it attached to your arm. Right. Uh, I think Nina from Cobra was probably one of the first to one do a curved stick. It. Yeah. To be fair to her, she reckons she was on a scuba di scuba diving holiday in uh, Egypt, and she she tripped over and uh, something fell out of her snorkel. Right. Sounds a bit weird. <laughs> it sounds a bit crazy. Yeah. Doesn't I mean, it? what what was brown that had come out of a snorkel? God only knows. <laughs> one of her love eggs. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, yeah. moving swiftly on. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> Have I got to edit the, that bit? No, the, no all, all, all the viewers would probably like to realise that I, I have a sense of humour, you know. Yeah. I don't take life that serious, really. It's, uh, I do and I don't. I, I love having fun, you know. You've got to, haven't you? It's like... Yeah. It's, too short, life yeah, not life's life. way too short. You know, everybody gets so serious about yeah. things, and you know, at the end of the day, this is just meant to be relaxing. It's enjoyment and fun, and all the exactly. all the people that watch this that like having a laugh as well, and that 
the, the bits they always remember with any films that I'm in is the funny stuff. And, uh, I'm sure there's a few of them. Oh, I've got tons of stories there, clearly. But the, uh, some of them are a bit rude as well. But maybe I'll tell you a few later. Yeah, but, we'll save uh, that for off camera. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so obviously uh, you're quite well known for your baits. Yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, something I've, all, I've used a lot of in the past, yeah. your, your pop-ups and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I, I first started selling it commercially in the old shop in uh, Alstringham. And uh, what happened was, I didn't have much money to start the shop, I only had 10 grand. Which and, is not uh, a lot when it comes to well, shop, a joke. It's a joke, it's how I put the shop fittings in it, it's like, where's the tackle? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I started concentrating on all small bits, you know, all rig bits and everything. And I think people started coming in a lot because they knew I was dead approachable and uh, I was showing all the kids how to tie rigs and everything, you know. And I was always making bait in the shop with a little garden rolling table, yeah. my own bait. And uh, I had my own recipes, my own base mix and everything. And then some of them started saying, why don't you sell us some of that bait? And I said, well, it's my thing, this. And then I thought, well, maybe I should, to get more people in the shop. Yeah. So I started doing the base mixes for £4.50 a kilo, just a bag. Just a bag. We, we didn't have freezer baits and stuff in them days. But I think that's just when Richworth were doing a bit, but not much. Just the ready-mades and that. And Duncan Kay had done them previously. Yeah, and, uh, like the pink champagnes but, and stuff yeah, like that. But, yeah, yeah them red carpet ones and yeah, all that. Yeah. You know. And then I thought about it. I thought, well, everyone used to just buy a couple of kilo and go home and get, crack the eggs and make their own stuff. So I did some recipes with them and a lot of people were speculating on the recipes, saying, why have you got salt in there? And now it's all apparent. And then uh, I used to have liquidized pig liver in there and uh, yeah. you know, natural things yeah. that suggested recipes. And uh, I did this uh, chicken meal bait. I'd got the uh, poultry meal, which was dead eye protein content. And I'd done loads of testing and realized that you have to put less than sort of 30%, around 25% of the chicken meal, otherwise the bait's too strong. Right. So I've done loads of messing and that was a crack of that. And yeah. uh, John Baker sorted out a chicken flavour for us. Well I did, I tested loads that John supplied and I got this one that was amazing. And all the guys were catching loads of fish on it. And then uh, John says, oh they're not expensive chicken flavour, he's a good mate of mine JB. And uh, I says, well I'd like this one here John. He went. If you want it, you crafty bastard, he says, it must be a cracker. <laughs> he says, that's the expensive one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he's got me now. So he had, he had, you know, he'd sourced it and got it, so I had to pay through the nostrils off JB for that one. <laughs> but we had to have it because it was so good. It was the one, yeah. yeah and the, the, the bait's got a little sort of legendary following in their own right. They used to do the spice fish and bird seed baits and that. And uh, then, obviously, Mainline came on the scene selling ready-made boilies and... Uh, then I, I packed in the shop and went working at Trebs of Wimslow and, and the bait was the best selling bait in the shop by a mile. Right. Some of the times he said it was selling more than all the others put together. Wow. In, in packet form where you roll it yourself. And I was on the uh, shillings rolling it at the back of the shop, uh, stinking a bait all day, every day. And uh, It's not a yeah, glamorous life, is it? No, rolling it wasn't bait. great, no. <laughs> And uh, I had a bait gun explode one day, got a piece of plastic in the base mix, not my base mix, another one. And it wedged in and it was one of them massive Cox's guns, the big about guns, four yeah, kilos. Yeah. It built up pressure, there was no release valve on it, it blew the end of the gun off, <laughs> smashed the shilling table to pieces. It broke my finger in six places and ripped <laughs> my nail off. And the end of the gun went 40 yards down the wall and smashed a brick in the wall. <laughs> Imagine that, and the thing was just shattered. Yeah. Yeah, shattered, blown to pieces it was. Jesus. And uh, anyway, uh, so that's how I did the journey with the bait, really. Right. And uh, then I worked for Dynamite, I did the fluoros. Uh, you know, what happened was, this is a good story, I used to make my own specials always, and I'd spent years since 1981 when I first started using them, messing with them, keeping diaries and recipes, and soon realised that just getting some rich with pop-up mix and put in a flavour in is not the one. It'll catch fish, but it's not the one. There's loads of things in the ones that I've been messing with over the years. 
you know, like using MSG in the bait. Even though it's a single, they can taste it before it's in the mouth. Yeah, yeah. And there's some, you know, with some of the sweeteners you're using at exaggerated levels and things, there's, there's things working in the bait that, and some naturals as well. You can use some spices and essential oils and they all add to the and mix. You, know, you get multi-layered multi, multi -layered sort of components coming out of the yeah, bait. Yeah. A lot of what I've got, I've got, uh, you know, buku oil in and uh, some quite exotic little bits and pieces. Yeah. And it might not appear much, but it, it's actually... bait will work over a, a long period. If, you've got a, if you're on a difficult water where you've got to leave them out for a long time, you get a lot of them and you can't smell anything, they're washed out and it's all finished. But I've got, like I say, essentials in there and stuff that tend to linger, the you know. They will linger, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's my little speciality. Anyway, I did, I got asked to do this tackle and gun show, do a talk. And this guy who run me up, he says, will you do 45 minute talk? I says, yeah, of course I will, no problem. He says, we'll put you up and pay you, you know, whatever it was, a couple of hundred quid or something. I says, yeah, happy days. He says, what are you bringing? I says, what do you mean, what am I bringing? <laughs> I said, I'm bringing the slides for the talk. He said, no, what, what are you bringing to sell? He says, when Des Taylor or John Wilson comes and Bob Nudd, they all bring DVDs and all. I said, I haven't got any DVDs. <laughs> he said, you must have some of it. I says, leave it with me, I'll think of something. I thought, I get asked loads of times around that period. This was about 1996, 97. People wanting the baits off me. Yeah. You know, I've given people some baits in the past and they've gone, I've had loads of fish, I've had five fish on one boiler and keep drying them out, making them last. <laughs> Weird stuff like that. Yeah. I've just met on my travels. So uh, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll get a hundred plastic pots. So I went down, I went and bought them from a chemist, not even a pot supplier. <laughs> Paid through the nostrils for them and I rolled a load of bait myself, a load of these pink pop-ups and orange ones with uh, pineapple and butyric and uh, uh, some other little bits and pieces in there. And they were gorgeous, you know, they were nice, all about 16 mil. And I did 100 pots and thought, surely that's enough. For, might sell. No labels on them, nothing. Nothing, just nothing. clear just, pop, just pops. Yeah. <laughs> pop ups in them. Yeah, like bear that. in mind, everyone's used to seeing them everywhere in the shops now, but then they were unusual. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't even a shop, it was the talk. So I did the talk and I put some emphasis on the fluoros, how I'd used them all these years and all the rest of it. I'll never forget it, Ian Welsh was there and he transported the carp. Uh, from Sparshall in the big tank. Right, yeah. And I says to Ian, he's a mate of mine, he's a very nice fella, I says, Ian, can I test some of my pop ups in the tank with your fish? In front of a load of people, he goes, Frank, do yourself a favour, mate. He says, You're going to look a prick. <laughs> he says, Them fish are stressed because they've been moved. And he says, And if you put even the carp pellets in there that we feed them on, they won't take them at the moment because they're right. stressed. He said, And I don't want to have to be scooping your boilies out of the tank because they won't touch him. I says, well, surely just putting one in is not going to harm it. I'll just lift it out. He goes, yeah, put one in then. I put it in and every single fish in the tank came up and sucked in the bait and had it in the mouth. And what I did notice was they were firing it out right. at real high speed. And I thought, that's an interesting reaction. Yeah. And it's like some of the things were quite spicy and hot in it. It's like they've gone, oh, oh, that's a bit much. <laughs> yeah, but that's when you look them, isn't it? When, yeah, they're, going, exactly, when yeah. they're getting, oof. Anyway, I don't know if that was anything to do with it, but uh, Ray Dale Smith was there from Carper Us. He's a right old rogue, Ray, isn't he? And he's uh, an old friend of mine, you know. A good sense of humour the guy's got. And he had his stand there, you know, it's like an East End uh, sort of car boot sale. <laughs> and he's got all his rig stuff and everything. And I says, I've got 100 pots of this stuff. He says, bring it on my stand. He says, Hutch is here, Mark Hutchinson. He'll flog them for you while you do your talk. So I said, yeah, all right then. So I did the talk and I come back and uh, there's no pots left. Oh, and I says, there's this guy came up to me. He goes, you've got no more pots left. He says, some greedy bastards had eight pots at the end and we nearly ended up fighting. He says, this is ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, I had to go and do another bit of the talk. I had a little break and then went back and did some more. And uh, I never thought of it, but I took two 10 kilo bags that weren't in pots just to show people. And I says, I would so wish I'd have brought some more pots, which you could have poured some in for the people to sell them. Yeah. He says, mate, he says, what are you talking about? He said, I've sold both 10 kilo bags. Sold the bags? how? <laughs> he says, I've sold, I've been counting out 50 at a time and they've been having them in the hand. In the hands? They bought them by hand. <laughs> what? On my children's life. <laughs> Ask Mark Hutchinson. 
we sold the lot and I had a big wad of money there like that. And I went, I can't believe this. So I sold two 10 kilo bags loose right. and a hundred pots. Crazy. And Pete from uh, Dynamite got to hear about it. And he approached me and he says, we're a new company, we, we do the tiger nuts and the hemp seed and that. And he says, but I can see into the future. And he says, you haven't got the, the, the clout to do it and the distribution is too much for you. Why don't you do these floral baits with us? And I says, yeah, all right. So we worked out a deal and they took me on as a consultant. And we did it. And I think they did more than a million quids with the first year. Yeah. I was going to uh, say, I, I, it was I meteoric. There was a there was a point where I think every one of the yeah. guys I fish we've had at least one pot. Yeah, and it, <laughs> it, it, it was ridiculous with a little booster in it and yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean they they had uh, teams of guys just making them and they couldn't make them fast enough. Yeah. Uh, what was the white ones? Was it milky toffee or something like that? Uh, that was the evaporated milk and ice cream. Yeah, that, you know, Jeff. Oh. Well, I got in touch with Jeff Kemp. He disappeared. See, that really worked well for me. Well, it was one of my old favourites. Yeah, and. Uh, Jeff Kemp had disappeared from the carp fishing scene, but I always kept in touch with him, and he went into breeding koi carp. Right, okay. So I rung Jeff, and I says, look, Jeff, I want the green zinc, and I want the, uh, the pink zinc, but he couldn't get the pink zinc. He'd lost the, the profile and the recipe for it yeah. that the, the manufacturer had, but he could get the green zinc, and he could get the evaporated milk and ice cream sauce, so yeah, they're in the range, and that's how it was. And then, uh, you know, yeah. It went from there, really. Yeah, I've just had a fish on the zinc, actually. Oh, yeah, from a yeah. uh, firm called Mad Baits. Yeah. Um, Jerry Hammond is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of pioneering yeah. the zinc again. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just done well, there. Funny enough, Jerry used to say to me, oh, them green zinc ones. He yeah. says, I'm having loads in the yeah, cold he temperatures. Yeah, like, he likes them, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does like yeah. them. Yeah. So yeah, fair play. So and and so that well, I was there for about twelve years with Dynamite. I had some good times with him, you know, with Pete Chandler and all the boys. And yeah. I suggested they got Terry involved. Yeah, because uh, Terry's a different type of angler to me. He, he's, he's a big fish angler. I think he's, he's a different type of angler to most, isn't he? He's, he's, he's yeah, like he's a, a in a world of his own. Yeah, he's he's totally focused on fishing. I mean, I've got children. I've got a life besides fishing and yeah. other interests. Terry's sort of full on. And I says, what you need is someone like Terry that's obviously a you know, top angler that uses a lot of food bait. And then they did the sauce with Terry. Yeah, that's and, right. And uh, that's how that started, really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm good, good friends with Terry. He's a good lad. Yeah, he's a good uh, lad, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I actually felt in the end uh, like I could go no further with the company because with a big corporate like that, you get some of the salesmen trying to impress their their views on you. And I thought, like, they come to me and say, well, we're into Europe, we've got to do a monster crab and we've got to do a strawberry. And you're thinking, oh, Jesus Christ, don't yeah. you did that 25 years ago? Yeah. I mean, that's what the French, for example, like. But I think, how boring. It, it, it didn't light my fire, that. I no. sort of wanted uh, my own thing. So I says, right, let me do one bait that's just mine then in this European range. And for the UK, and that was the uh, spicy prawn and shrimp. I was going to say, it's the prawn and shrimp. Yeah, and yeah, Pete yeah. Chandler says to me, I'll guarantee that'll be the worst seller because it's not a branded name. It's not already out there. I says, well, we'll see. I says, it's not only that, mate. I said, it's continual results. It's what the bait does. So we did that one and he went, uh, you were right, we've had to do it in a freezer bait. He said, that's blown the others out of the water. And that's because it was a better quality bait. Better quality bait, It, yeah. it was put together with, with more knowledge behind it. I was going to say, there's, there all. is a lot of baits being produced now that have yeah. just got no thought behind them or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then I, I did uh, that tuna one and that was a big seller with them. And yeah. then, but I still wanted to do things my way and I wanted the fluoros with the extra, when things get big and money comes into it, it's almost like a kind of, you ain't got control of the uh, the reins. Yeah, I understand. I mean, it's dead competitive now. There's loads of good bait companies out there, tons of them. It's like, there's all these little operations that are operating from the garden shed. It must be springing up two or three a week, you know. There's loads, there's uh, loads. And they usually go by the wayside because it's far from difficult, the bait business. Yeah. It's uh, from easy, it's, it's very yeah, difficult it's actually. Very difficult. Because you've got 
some of the big players that have been doing it 20 odd years, like Mainline, I mean, Kevin Stephen makes them right. And they've got a superb business, you know, and they've done it right, but they've got 20 odd years' experience behind them. And, exactly. and they've done it the right way. They have their testers doing it, teasing for a couple of years or a year before it's released. Before and it's so the market. <coughs> that's a great, yeah. great way of doing it. But when you're smaller, it's a more organic thing, you know, you've got to do it step by step. And the trouble with me is because I've been with Dynamite. Everyone suddenly thought, oh, he's got his own factory now. Uh, they don't think that you've got to start from scratch yeah. and, and, and do everything. And then you, you need to be super rich to do all the packaging. They're jazzy. And so what are these pellets you're hiding down here? Oh, these are, we, we've, 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 we've just, these are brand new prototypes that we've got. And uh, these are specific carp pellets a lot of companies yeah it's no big secret they just get standard pellets from screttings or one of the other companies and they just put them in a cement mixer or whatever they're using and lob some flavor in and that's it yeah, yeah. well i didn't want that i wanted some of the separate ingredients that go in the food bait in here and uh, some of the attractors and some of them are like you know we've got various attractors and uh, l030 and yeah. uh, you know, some minamino type compounds. Yeah. And I've got everything in there that I want, so that I'm thinking, pellets ain't that cheap anymore. No, they're not. They're, we're not good pellets. No, so you're starting to see people, you can just go and get like trout pellet type things, you know, heavy or pig feed pellets. So I thought, no, nah, I don't want to go down that route. And that's why most companies start the, hit the ground running, they'll get any old pellet and do that and then just dish it out. Yeah. And we've been going two years now and we've not done a pellet because we've been Because you wanted to do it right, yeah. 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 No, fair play. Uh, are, they, are they like quite a fast breakdown pellet or that? Medium, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. So I don't like them when they turn to mush too quick. There's a bit of substance to them so the, it gives the fish time to find them. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. No, and that's it. I mean, I've, I've had that with the pellets I've used in the past and break down very, very quickly and, yeah. and turn into that cloud, which is great. I mean, it's all, it's all doing the Sources job. Sources for courses. I mean, yeah. you know, you might want to be mixing them and using different breakdown times. And exactly. That. I don't know. It depends on where you're fishing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I want something that's just, the bits don't just take it instantly, you know. I want something that's got a bit of substance to it. Fair play. Yeah. Fair play. Uh, so, oh, the other thing I was going to mention is, I've got these, you know, like, this is a funny story, this one, actually. I, I'm dead funny about my rigs, and I don't like, because they ban lead shot, some of the substitutes massive. So if you've got a pop-up that's too buoyant, you've got to do it a great big shot. Yeah. Uh, you know what I was talking about earlier, where the fish can feel it on the lip? Yeah. Quite often, when I've been watching them, they felt the shot. Beside the hook, they felt the shot on the lip and it's just gone just before it's even away. in. Yeah. So I've been, since I've seen it with my own eyes, where I was catching some fish right under my feet, and uh, on reeds mere, ironically, and I was stood there with my hood up and they were taking the bait right at my feet. And, uh, a couple of them big fish as well, I had a 33 like that, no, 34. Yeah, so I watched it take my hook bait. Yeah. And was seeing what they would shy off with and what they were getting rid of. And uh, same on Birch Grove when I left the camera running. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, what happened was, I thought, a big clumsy shot on there is going to do you no good whatsoever. No. And I like wafters anyhow, the slow sinkers that just rest on the hook so the shot doesn't even come into the equation. And that was one of the reasons why I like that. And I catch a lot of fish on wafters. And when we started first doing the pop-ups, I made them on purpose, not too buoyant. It suited me. It was my company. I thought, I'll have them how I want them. So I was doing it so a number six shot would sink a 16 milli. Right. Then you're getting all these people, what are you doing, asshole? These, uh, these aren't lifting my chod for three weeks. I'm going, I don't use the chod rig that much. But it's become a big phenomenon, hasn't it? Yeah, it has, and yeah. I'm thinking, but I like, these are perfect for how I like fishing, but I'm not everybody. No. Everybody expects them to be up like a, a good one. Yeah. So we've had to change it. Now, I'm dead and knocked, because I'm thinking, yeah, be perfect for chods, but if I wanted to do a, just the normal rig with a coated up length from that, thing, yeah. you have to have a shot on it. I'm thinking, yeah. unless you use something like the old KD rig or something. Yeah, yeah. So, but you've got to do what the masses want. So we thought, oh, okay, let's 
the, the mad on chods let's take it a stage further so we did specific chod baits and these if i put them in the titanic they lift it they're, they're ridiculously yeah, buoyant. Buoyant. Yeah. yeah and uh we've had some in a jar of water in the unit for just over a year and it's in the same position on the still chod. there yeah yeah wow and uh so what i've done as well is i've I've got all the, the very, very best classic little combinations and put them in the chods. And I, I always wanted to get the old Rod Hutchinson and coffee cream. And yeah. he, when he mixed with Nash, the com they changed companies. I can smell them already. Yeah. <laughs> and they changed companies. And, and I know Rod very well. And I says, Rod, that was the best flavour on singles for catching fish anywhere I've ever used. It was a, just like a miracle bait. And I thought, I had 17 bites in the winter on that on Reed's Wow. In one winter. Yeah. And I was only doing Saturday days. Yeah, Reed's Mere's a big nights. place as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I had two times where I caught four in a day in the winter on wow. it. And that was on these. On these. A slightly yellowy colour, like an off yellow, like a mustard colour. That was because I had liver powder in there. Right, right. Anyway, and uh, Minamino and uh, like a Davina liquid liver I had in as well. Anyway, what happened was, it changed. And the, as soon as the newer the new version of the coffee cream guy, I couldn't catch any fish on it. I could never get it and Rod says, yeah, it changed. And he says, and that was one of the problems. So I've done a lot of delving and messing around and managed to get, piece all the information together. And I've got the original blend on the same solvent and everything. It's not a very regular thing. It's a diacetin base, which is not used a lot. Let's put it that way nowadays. Yeah. And that is the original one. Wow. And it's, uh, that's one of the lengths I've gone to to try and duplicate it because I wanted it for myself. Because you wanted it for yourself, yeah. And then I'm yeah. thinking, I feel a bit mean because when I'm out on my travels, people say to me, oh, let's have a few of them baits. And I'm going, it's almost like tempting to say, <laughs> oh, these are mine, you're not having them. But I'm not like that. I end up giving them out yeah. to people. So I thought, oh, sod it. Might as well just put them in the range. Put them know? in the range, yeah. Fair and, play. Uh, but it does sort of nag at me a bit thinking, with this one particular thing, it's like one thing I would like to have just had for myself. I'll be honest with you, you know. Yeah, and yeah. then uh, Steve Featherston, an old mate of mine from up Manchester, he used to fish on the mirror. He went, I'm not bothered about anything else. He says, I've just got to have some of them straight away. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Right, well, thanks a lot, Frank. I've uh, really no enjoyed uh, picking your brains. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I look forward to um, doing a bit more with you in the future. We're going to cover some rigs and stuff later on in the year at some at some time when we can get you yeah no problem so, any, uh, any time you want you know I'm fantastic easy going with these sort of things so. fantastic mate. nice to meet you as yeah. well and you, right, cheers thank you.